Welcome to episode 303 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Matt Fine, who served in the FBI for nearly 23 years. He reviews his investigation of a disgruntled Philadelphia Phillies fan who hacked computers and launched a cyber attack against the team and email accounts of reporters at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Daily News, leaving messages voicing his complaints about the Phillies management. Initially, Matt served as a field agent for approximately eight years assigned to the Philadelphia field office. During that time, he conducted white-collar crime investigations, but a bulk of his field career was spent on computer intrusion investigations and managing national cyber investigative programs in the field of operational technologies and electronic surveillance. Matt served in the cyber division, in which he was the program manager of the elite quick reaction team of cyber special agents known as the Cyber Action Team, our CAT, Regional Cyber Action Teams, and the Botnet Initiative, which combated botnets and the threat they posed to the internet and infrastructure. Matt led two successful national takedown operations known as Operation Bot Roast and Operation Bot Roast 2, Matt also served as the chief of the executive support unit in the operational technology division, where he led technical operational coordination and strategic technical industry liaison. Prior to his retirement, Matt served as a chief within the FBI's operational technology division, leading their electronic surveillance program. Matt currently serves as a specialist leader at Deloitte, and serves clients in the government and public sector space with a focus on cyber, operational technology, and leadership. If you haven't noticed, I'm not feeling 100% right now. I have the flu, but the show must go on. In your podcast app's description of this episode, you'll find links to where you can join my reader team, buy me a cup of coffee, and learn more about me and my nonfiction book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, and my two FBI crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, all available as ebooks and paperbacks wherever books are sold, and audiobooks available on Audible and Spotify. They make excellent holiday gifts, especially my FBI word search puzzle book, a fun stocking stuffer. Thanks for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Matt Fine. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hey, Jerry. Great to hear from you. Yeah. We used to hang out together in the Philadelphia division, so it's great to have the team back together again. That's absolutely right. It's been a long time, Jerry, but it's great to hear your voice again. I'm real excited because... Listeners are always emailing me asking for more cybercrime. I actually got an email last week. I think it might have been a comment on LinkedIn requesting more cybercrime cases. They're in luck because we have you today. Your expertise is in this field, but you're going to talk about a cybercrime case that you worked on when you were in Philadelphia about 20 years ago. That's correct. The cyber program in the FBI was still in its infancies a little over 20 years ago, and I was one of the first cyber agents in the FBI. So the case I'll be going over is one of the earlier cyber cases in the FBI. All right. So where do you want to start? I can start at the beginning, of course. We'll start in 2001, Jerry. The terrorist attacks on the United States, September 11, 2001. Everybody kind of remembers where they were at that moment in time. Just shortly after the attacks and everybody was working for the September 11th case, we got a phone call. The FBI field office in Philadelphia got a phone call from the Philadelphia Phillies of a potential cyber attack on their network. Back then, John Chesson and Chris Wilk and myself were the three cyber agents at the time. And we got the phone call that there was something going on with the Philadelphia Phillies 
which is a major league baseball team in Philadelphia, their network was being under attack. We contacted them and visited them and they described that their network was down essentially from this attack. We started to conduct our investigation with cooperation from the Philadelphia Phillies. They were fantastic to learn, A, how do they run their network and their business, of course. And then what were the clues? What was the evidence of this attack? Where did it come from? What was it doing to their system? At the time, one of the officers of the Philadelphia Phillies was a retired U.S. attorney by the name of Mike Stiles. And he had a close relationship, of course, with his former office at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia. That's how our connection started. We learned rather quickly that it was a distributed denial of service attack on their network. That brought their network down to their knees where they could not perform their business, essentially, with their computers, with the internet, et cetera. I do want to caveat, Jerry, that back then, 2001, if people can recall, the internet then was not what it is today. It was dial-up. Internet was still a thing back then. Cable modems were kind of new at the time. Just want to provide your audience a, a little bit of a context to what the environment of the internet was back at that time. After many interviews with the Philadelphia Phillies, we learned soon after that the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is the major newspaper in the Philadelphia area and the region, quite frankly, was also under a cyber attack. At the time, Jerry, we did not know if those were related. In fact, we treated them separately at the time. And then we started to interview the Philadelphia Inquirer at the time to find out what was going on with their attack. The fact that they were occurring relatively at the same time was a bit unusual. There were two major organizations in Philadelphia, but we did not put them together at that time. Usually we keep, as you know, investigations, you keep matters separate until you find some kind of conspiracy or joint events between two cases. That's what happened. It's two major attacks within, I think, about a month of each other occurred at these two large organizations in Philadelphia. And then we discovered a few other smaller entities within the Philadelphia region that were also under attack. Again, we did not put them all together as one big attack. It took some time to figure this out. And one thing I would like to note for your audience is cyber cases usually bring along a pretty massive, I'll use the word massive, amount of digital evidence. To go through that evidence with tools back at the time in 2001 was daunting, was absolutely daunting. One thing I also mentioned, Jerry, is that's very important for investigators or audience members who want to become cyber investigators. Training is absolutely critical to the performance of anybody's duties, of course, but especially a cyber investigator, I would say. One individual I want to point out that really supported me and Chris and John during our careers, I think he might have worked with you as well, was Bill Matisak. He was our supervisor of the program at the time, and Bill really allowed us to go and get training so we were skilled to do our jobs versus trying to do the job kind of on the fly and do on-the-job training. So I, I want to give Bill a shout out for allowing us into really investing into our training to allow us to perform our jobs. Once we gathered all the information, Jerry, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Phillies, and some of these smaller entities of this attack, we started to see patterns. That's yeah, one thing we learn as investigators, you start seeing patterns and common threads. We were able to see that these attacks had some commonalities with somebody posting on a bulletin board, an internet bulletin board, that seemed to have some kind of connection to these attacks. It would be akin to maybe in today's age, somebody conducting a violent act and then posting it online that they were responsible for that attack, sort of like that. We started to see some chatter on some bulletin boards, public bulletin boards. Not that a person did the attack, but somebody complaining about these organizations in Philadelphia. And so the timing again, Jerry, was unusual that, okay, these entities in Philadelphia got attacked and somebody was complaining about these entities online. So that started to steer us in a way that, okay, there's something going on here. Let's start investigating these bulletin boards and this person. Nobody puts their true name on the bulletin board. They use an alias to put their stuff online. And so we had to investigate that. And we started to see a pattern of somebody complaining about the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team, quite frankly, and people writing about the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team, which is the Philadelphia Inquirer Sports Department, of course. We started to hone in on some patterns here. One thing I'd like to mention is most, if not all, investigations in cybercrime start with what we term in the FBI as unknown subject. We don't know who this individual or individuals are conducting this criminal behavior or acts. 
So we have to label them as unknown subjects or in FBI parlance, we say unsub. In many other investigations, as you know, Jerry, we typically get predicated evidence of a crime happening and we kind of know who the suspect is. This makes it more challenging when you don't have an identifier of who the bad cyber actor is. So that just puts a little bit more stress on the investigators. A lot of times, I'd say over half the challenge in a cyber investigation is just determining who the person or persons are conducting the crime. Actually, capturing the crime is not that hard in a cyber investigation. The damage is there. The victim is usually very cooperative with the FBI and provides evidence over to the FBI. But finding out who's actually behind the keyboards conducting the attacks is usually pretty difficult. And most of the work is behind identifying who that is. And as you know, Jerry, and especially back then, the internet provides a pretty well grounded environment for bad actors to be anonymous. That is another facet of a cyber investigation is the anonymity of both the person behind the keyboard and then their nefarious activities as well. The next individual I'd like to bring up was our assistant United States attorney, Mike Levy, who was a wonderful person to work with. He remained my mentor for most of my career. He was pretty technically savvy, which was fantastic. Again, back then, our prosecutors or assistant United States attorneys didn't really receive a whole lot of technical training in cybercrime. And Mike took it upon himself to self-learn how the internet operates, how data moves across the internet, and then how crime could happen on the internet. So Mike was an awesome partner to work with during this investigation and many other investigations after this. I'll bring us up to the point where we start to identify this case is involving many big and small entities within Philadelphia, and they're now all related to one another. The cyber attack is related to one another. So we start to have to assess the damages, right? That's something the U.S. Attorney's Office has to assess is what is the damage of this quote unquote crime? So we had to do that in cyber crime cases. It's not readily known what the damages are. Somebody robs a bank and they still X amount of money, you know, it's a pretty empirical evidence of what the crime is. But with a cyber crime, Jerry, it's hard to assess damages. It depends on the business, quite frankly. In this case, with the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Inquirer and some of the smaller entities around Philadelphia, the damage was mostly downed business and or time. I would say time is a category here. And as you know, being in this world of media, Jerry, time is critical. Time is money especially for an entity like the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is trying to publish, broadcast, or distribute news in print media. Print media in 2001 was still the mainstream way to read news versus the internet. I think soon after, maybe a couple of years after, it started to switch over to the internet. But when we talked to the Philadelphia Inquirer, they were very concerned that their news stories would not be able to get into their editorial room and then out to their audience in time compared to their competitors. That was a major component of how we had to assess damage to a victim in this case. We talked to many different people there, cybercrime cases. You're typically talking to the general counsel's office, the victim group itself, and officers of the company too. They want to learn what is going on, number one, and two, how to handle the cyber attack. These cyber attacks can exponentially grow as a problem to an organization in many different ways. So that's a big concern of why officers of a company get involved pretty quickly in these matters. Yeah, I can imagine that for a paper that's trying to put out at least one edition at the time, they may have been putting out several editions on a daily basis, right. having somebody attack their system, it's going to affect the bottom line. Yeah, let me give you a scale. And this is a real discussion I had with the victim. I said, okay, well, your internet went down. Oh, well, people's internet goes down and you try to get past that. And they gave me a really good example of how it impacted their business. They advised me that their reporter in Washington, D.C. had to get a story up to the Philadelphia office for the editorial room to get it up and out on the paper. And the email that she sent with the story took four hours four hours. This is the day and age of the internet, right? Which is usually in under a second. To Philadelphia, I went, okay, so four hours, that's not terribly bad. You got the story correct. And, and she goes, yeah, but Matt, I could drive from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia quicker. That gave me a frame of reference of how the negative impact of this cyber attack took on this organization. Just imagine you could literally drive a hand carry story from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia faster than the internet. That really opened my eyes to the damages to this organization. And that's just one reporter. Think about all the reporters trying to send stories to Philadelphia to get it on print media and out to the public. 
It put things in perspective, I'll say, Jerry. Once we figured the damages, which was a significant part of our role as well, we had to start to assess the attacks and the patterns of attacks and how things were getting the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Phillies down to their knees as far as their ability to operate their businesses. One thing I do want to note, Jerry, in cybercrime cases is how important the technical staff at these victim organizations are. And this happens in any cybercrime victim organization is the importance of the technical staff, the systems administrators, the engineers, and their leaders to cooperate with the FBI because they technically and legally own all that data. And in order for the FBI to effectively investigate, we need their cooperation, we need their expertise, and we need the data. That's where a lot of times the legal counsel of these organizations come in and help facilitate that to make sure there's no policies being violated by their company. Oftentimes, Mike Levy, our prosecutor, we get involved and send search warrants over to protect the company, even though they're cooperating with us just to protect the sanctity of the investigation. We would subpoena information or get a search warrant. So the transfer of evidence, the integrity of that transfer was clean. So that's also something that's a little different in cyber investigations. I know in your former world jury in white collar crimes, you guys did that with subpoenas a lot, I believe, with banks, I believe. So yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we, we do similar actions to keep the integrity of the case proper. The one other area that I like to discuss is because of the Major League Baseball Philadelphia Phillies angle to this attack, it spilled over to national news a little bit, to the national news sports reporters. We were able to talk to some other sports departments around the country who were not directly affected, but indirectly affected from this attack. That's another thing I like to mention, Jerry, is cyber attacks are not contained to a geography. Oftentimes, they can spill over As you know, the internet really doesn't have any boundaries. So it can spill over. And that's something that I don't know if we were unprepared for that, but we were still in the day and age where the FBI is kind of contained to regions, I guess, or territories or states. This brought this into another realm of across the United States. And later I'll talk about into other countries, quite frankly. You mentioned how it wrecked havoc on the Inquirer's operations. What did it do for the Phillies? It had a similar effect, Jerry. So the Phillies network also went down. Now, luckily for them, I believe this was, it was just the beginning of their off season. So it was, I think this was November 2001, December 2001. So right after the attack of September 11th. So luckily during off season, Major League Baseball business is not as busy as during the season, as you can imagine. One of their concerns was the ability, or in this case, inability to talk to their business partners, especially their sponsors and advertisers. So that was their concern about damages. I can't communicate with the people who help me run my business, i.e. partners and advertisers. So that was their damages. Finally, the thread that pulled this all together was... The fact that the perpetrator, the bad actor here, started to be very specific in his displeasure with the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Inquirer online in these public bulletin board areas. The specificity of his displeasure was on a topic regarding a Philadelphia Phillies baseball player by the name of Scott Rowland. Scott Rowland at the time was the third baseman for the Philadelphia Phillies, and he was an all-star player. He was rumored to be traded to another team. That just really made this unknown subject very, very upset. This unknown subject was a devout fan of the Philadelphia Phillies. And as you know, Jerry, Philadelphia sports fans are super enthusiastic about their teams. Yes. You know that very well, right? It's, it's like a religion. It is absolutely like a religion. Those posts online about his displeasure were starting to become consistently on the topic of Scott Rowland and against the Philadelphia Choir and the Philadelphia Phillies. At the time, the FBI said, okay, we have somebody who's very, 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 very angry about these two organizations. And these posts happen soon after the attacks happen. There's something here. We got to go check it out. We decided to put pen register trap and trace, which is an electronic surveillance technique, to find out where the traffic is coming and going for these posts and to see if they were related to the traffic that was attacking the Philadelphia Inquirer. Could you explain that a little bit more? We talked about it when I did an episode on electronic surveillance with J.J. Claver. Yep. But could you talk about it a little bit more? What is a trap and trace? What yep. do you need in order to get one? Correct. Okay. So trap and trace, pen register trap and trace is an electronic surveillance technique that the FBI can use in an investigation that can determine where communications are coming and going. 
similar to that of a phone call, like a phone number, who's calling and who's receiving the call. The FBI does not get content of the phone call in a pen register traffic trace. I want to make that abundantly clear. It's just the routing of the communication traffic. Akin to, as you remember, uh, mail covers to some degree with who's the letter being addressed to and where's it coming from. That would be in the parlance of traditional mail. That would be what is equivalent to the digital version of a pen register traffic traces. Where is the sender sending the information and where is it being received, if that makes any sense? Yeah. And I use mail covers quite often in my cases. Yes. In order to get one of those, you need a federal magistrate to sign off. You have to write an application saying, hey, I believe a crime is being committed using this technique, in this case, the internet. And I believe the unknown subject, the criminal actor is communicating either with another co-conspirator or a victim. And I want to ascertain that evidence from the medium from which he's communicating. In this case, it was the internet. Once we got that up and running, the traffic was so immense, we couldn't really derive any intelligible information out of the pen register trap and trace. We were getting gigabytes of data a day. So imagine getting truckloads of boxes every day of logs of traffic of, let's say, telephone numbers in the traditional world. It was so much data, we really couldn't dissect what was going to and fro from the victim, as well as these bulletin ports. However, this is a good point in the case to describe. One of the owners of the bulletin board, his name was Jeffrey Lamana. He was actually critical of the investigation as well. He reported that somebody is stating that he had displeasure with these two victim organizations in Philadelphia and might have been behind these cyber attacks. Jeffrey Lamana was watching the news and he heard about these cyber attacks and he on his own started to figure out sort of like the FBI going, hey, these cyber attacks might be related to this guy on my bulletin board who's very very upset with these organizations. He actually called us. We didn't know he was out there. He called us and said, hey, Agent Fine, I believe there's something related to the attacks on these two organizations and my bulletin board. He actually came to our office and brought some information to us. And that led us to know what a specific alias was for this individual making these statements. That was actually a key turning point in the investigation. We had a figure in the public, a good upstanding citizen who reported something suspicious to us. And I think that goes to a lot of your other podcasts is the public is key in our investigations. So he reported that and he gave us some analysis. That was also pretty important too, because he was following the case in the news. Some of this stuff was reported in the news. Of course, the Philadelphia Inquirer is part of the news community. That was actually kind of key that Mr. Lamana had come to us with that key part of investigation. Because the Penn Register Trapper Trace did really produce finite, I would say, evidence, Mike Levy, the assistant United States attorney, said, hey, Matt, I think we need to go up on a Title III wiretap on this individual who's making these statements in the bulletin board. And we did have an IP address, an internet protocol address that gave us a source of where these displeasured statements came from. So we wrote an application to get a wiretap, and that can take a long time, as you know, Jerry. And we got it up and running. It took a few months because of the legal barriers. This type of wiretap had never happened in the FBI before. Let me go into that a little bit. The FBI typically at the time legally had to monitor the Title III, the wiretap, in the district for which the order was signed. In our case, we got the order in Philadelphia. The unknown subject lived in California. So this was a bit unusual. We actually went to the judge and said, hey, your honor, this is a little different. This is the internet. All of our victim activities happening in Philadelphia, our unknown subject lives in California. We would like to monitor this in California. And the judge, Judge Rebrano at the time, understood the argument. He asked us a few technical questions and he signed off on it. So that's the first time in the history of the FBI where we are actually able to collect in another state, in this case, California, and monitor it in another state, in this case, Philadelphia. So that was kind of unique, a new technique, essentially, for the FBI to be able to do that. You just said it took you several months to get this up and running. Was it several months of continued interference into the systems of the Inquirer and the Phillies? So this went on for months. Correct. It went on for months. It had dissipated a little bit, but going back to the quarter taking several months, there were a lot of legal reviews of this and a lot of technical discussions on how to conduct it as well. Because again, like I mentioned, the FBI had not done this before. The legal review has to go through two channels, one through the FBI, one through the Department of Justice. And then it meets at the middle at this office called the Office of Enforcement Operations, OEO. And that's where the final review happens before a federal judge will sign off on this. 
I had to personally go down to Washington, D.C. and brief this to the Office of Enforcement Operations. And that's highly unusual for an agent to do that. Usually an FBI agent based in headquarters will represent me to make that argument. But because this technique was so different, so unique, and so new, they requested I come down and brief it personally. So I did. And it got its approvals without any hitches, but it was something they had never reviewed before. So that was different. They asked a lot of questions like, how does this work? How does the internet work? And stuff like that. It was a good experience for me and a good experience for the FBI as well. Once you get this up and running at this time, have you narrowed into this particular person on the baseball bulletin boards? Or are you still looking at the possibility that others could be involved? Yeah, that's a great question, Jerry. I believe we were at the time very focused on this one individual. So we did not see any other individuals in the bulletin board that were seemingly sympathetic to this individual or conspiring with this individual. We believed it was one individual. However, your question is a good one. Oftentimes, cybercrime actors can perpetrate themselves as multiple people. They can have multiple aliases. I'm sure you and many of your audience members have multiple emails with multiple aliases on those emails. That can make things difficult, both technically and legally, because how do I know and how do I prove this email address belongs to Jerry Williams or that email belongs to Jerry Williams? At the time, we believed through just good old fashioned investigation that this was being perpetrated by one individual. So we got the wiretap running and we collected for only about two days. And again, the challenge for us, Jerry, was the volume of data. This individual was on his computer, I think like 20 hours a day. It was a lot of hours. When you're on your computer, you're producing a lot of traffic. We had to assess after two days that we were getting so much data, we really couldn't even review it properly. So we talked to the judge and we said, Your Honor, we're going to review what we have and then we're not going to collect anymore. It's just too much data. And we're going to report to you what we find. We did see traffic from this target location in California to the inquirer and to the bulletin board. We couldn't prove within the content there was an attack because he didn't execute an attack during the wiretap. That was what we were kind of looking for is to see, was he going to commit the crime while we were up on his internet traffic? At the time, he did not, in those two days, he didn't launch an attack. But we had enough probable cause at the time to get a search warrant and search that premises of that location where the internet traffic was emanating from in California. We conducted a search warrant and our agents in Los Angeles did a fantastic job. They interviewed the occupant owner of that residence. We identified him as Alan Eric Carlson, who eventually became the subject of our investigation. While Carlson did not confess to the internet attacks on the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Phillies, he did make statements that were consistent to the displeasure of the two organizations. And he made almost identical statements that were placed on the bulletin boards that precipitated the attacks. So circumstantially, we quote unquote, put him in the same room of of the crime. In this case, there's no room in the internet, of course, but uh, it was close enough to say this guy knows something about this crime. That was important, of course, was the interview of the subject. As you know, interviews of subjects are incredibly important for our investigations. One piece of evidence that was different in our case was the international intrigue part of this investigation and a lot of investigations for that matter. We saw a lot of traffic during, not from our wiretap, but from the course of the investigation coming from Canada. A lot of Canadian traffic was actually knocking the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Phillies network offline. We actually contacted through the Department of Justice and the Ministry of Justice in Canada to get cooperation from the Canadian government to find out what was going on with that internet traffic that was attacking Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Inquirer. I was very fortunate to link up with an old friend, old colleague of mine from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to get help from their investigative team on this case. And I want to mention something very important about that is I met this individual. His name was Sergeant Angelo Gagnon from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I met him in cyber training that Bill Matisak sent me to probably three years prior. And it was from that training, I built that relationship with this one individual and all my classmates for that matter. Lo and behold, a few years later, I'm calling him for help. As you know, Jerry, when you go to training, you meet a lot of individuals that you don't normally work with every day, but you remember them and you might call them for help later on. In this case, I called Angelo and said, hey, I got a case. There's some evidence that maybe in Canada, I need your help. And he jumped on it right away, Jerry. He was fantastic. We went through the proper channels between the two governments through our legal attache office in Ottawa. 
And I know you talked in your earlier podcast with Shannon McGarry about how legal attaches work. They are the face of the FBI in a foreign country to help facilitate investigations. Our legal attache in Canada help us connect with the Royal Canadian Mount Police officially and get the investigation moving up there. I was very fortunate to go up to Canada and meet up with Angelo and interview some victims and witnesses in Canada with the approval of the Canadian government. I, as an FBI agent, cannot go to Canada and conduct FBI operations without the blessing and approval of the Canadian government. We got their blessings. Sergeant Gagnon accompanied me. He was actually running the investigation. I just happened to be with him so I could place input into our discussions and interviews of our victims and witnesses in Canada. So that was extremely important in this investigation. The one thing I would point out, Jerry, one of the key witnesses in this case was the second largest internet service provider in Canada at the time called Cochico Cable. They were based just outside of Toronto, Ontario. We went up there and we didn't have any pre-planned questions with them. We just knew that traffic was emanating from their network to the victims in Philadelphia. We talked to them and we said, hey, did you notice a large volume of traffic that looked like it might have been a cyber attack go to Philadelphia on these dates? And they said, yes, we did. I said, oh, great. What did you do? Did you analyze it? And they said, Matt, we recorded the whole attack because it was so unusual on our network. We didn't know what was going on. So we recorded it. We captured it. Wow. Was, oh, exactly. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, right. Not only did they record the attack, they analyzed it. They analyzed what was going on. They gave us roughly two, three inch binders worth of evidence and analysis on the attack. That was a home run for us, Jerry. Incredible home run. So I got to give a shout out to Kojigo Cable and the Canadian government and the Canadian citizens for helping out this, that was absolutely critical. It was, a, it was a key part of our evidence to prove where the traffic was coming from, in this case, California, and Alec, Eric Carlson's home, essentially, to Canada. He configured his attack to hijack their network in a very unusual way and launch an attack from their network to the victims in Philadelphia. It was a very creative attack, very effective attack, but something that would not be readily known right away from, in this case, Kojiko Cable. So that was a key part of evidence for our investigation. Let me ask two questions for people like myself who are not so cyber savvy. I take it that he directed this traffic, he sidetracked this traffic to Canada in order to further disguise his identity. Yes, that is correct. That was one reason. The other reason I believe was, and I don't want to give his technique away because I don't want people to copycat the attack. So I'm not going to give how he conducted it. He essentially configured traffic from his computer to make the Kojiko cable network react. And that reaction would launch an attack to anywhere he wanted, in this case, Philadelphia. So the way he did it was very low budget. (laughs) It wasn't sophisticated, but was incredibly effective for his purposes. All right. And then my other question Mm -hmm. is, what responsibility, if any, does Kojiko Cable have to notifying the victims? Yeah. Are are the victims, when they see this strange activity? They were upstanding citizens, but they were also trying to figure out what was going on. They did not know the damages, per se, of the attack. They just knew something strange had gone on on their system. And it was routing an immense amount of traffic to the United States, in this case, Philadelphia. But beyond that, they didn't know that that downstream avalanche, I'll call it that, of internet traffic, how that affected the end point of the traffic in Philadelphia. They didn't know that until we called them. When we called them saying it knocked out two large organizations for days, generally over weeks, but it was in pockets of days, they had no idea. I don't think they felt the need to report it to any authority for that matter. But their policy of studying strange behavior on their network was critical to our investigation. So when they started to capture, record, and analyze the strange traffic on their own policy, that benefited us at the FBI and the Royal Canadian Mount Police to conduct the investigation. After that key piece of evidence, we had enough evidence to say that Alan Eric Carlson had conducted the crime and got an arrest warrant for him. We'll fast forward on the charges of the indictment against him. He entered a plea of not guilty, and we went to trial. After about two weeks of testimony, he was found guilty on, I think, 79 counts, which is a lot of counts for a cybercrime attack. 
it's a little bit unusual to have that many counts. At the time, there were only two statutes in the U.S. criminal code for cybercrimes. There might be more today. I'd have to look at that. But at the time, there were only two. And to have 79 counts based on mainly those two statutes is unusual to have that many. But we had so many victims from a volume perspective at the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Philadelphia Phillies, and these smaller entities. Mike Levy, I got to give him a lot of credit, argued those charges and got a successful guilty verdict on all 79 counts. One of which I want to mention, Jerry, one of those charges was unusual and had never been done before, I don't think, was emotional harm from a cyber attack. Think about that, Jerry, an emotional harm from a cyber attack. And this is 2003, I think we went to trial. And that was like, I was like, I never heard of that statute before. Emotional but, uh, harm from a cyber attack. Yeah. So, but the emotional harm to who? To, to who? the Felt Choir, their employees who were not able to, th- that's a good question, Jerry. They weren't able to get their news stories out and get their publications out. What I did not realize is writers and reporters, their equity, their brand is their stories. And if they don't get stories out, their brand gets damaged. And you kind of know this as a podcaster and an author. I didn't realize that. And so when your stories are not getting out, you're getting damages, both in brand and in this case, emotional, because now you might be out of a job. So again, that's something I learned as an agent and as a wonderful part of being an agent is you learn how your victims in this case uh, operate and sometimes have damages that you can't see like emotional harm. So that was unusual that we were able to bring those charges against the subject. In a cyber crime case, you think of emotional harm in violent crimes all the time, post-traumatic syndrome and so forth. But from a cyber attack, this is, it was a little bit unusual. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that's, again, talking about white collar crime. Sometimes people don't see that emotional harm Correct. when somebody loses their life savings. But right. my goodness, that's that emotional harm is significant also. Yeah, a- absolutely. And now we see that more today in attacks because of people are living their lives online a little bit more and people communicate a lot more online. And so the investor emotions online a lot more. But this is, again, over about 20 years ago. The internet was a little different back then where traffic wasn't as much out there. The iPhone did not exist at this time. Twitter did not exist at this time. Other mediums did not exist at this time. It was a different era, a different environment. But uh, you look back, and again, I got to give Mike Levy a lot of credit for being creative and really bringing the the weight of the government behind this case and, and putting the perpetrator responsible for this account. Talk a little bit about the jury. Yes. Because they obviously had to be educated about yes. all of this, too. That's a great point, Jerry. It was a jury trial. Mike Levy spent an entire day, and it might have been a day and a half, giving them a class or classes on how the internet worked. So educating the jury on any case is very, very important. But something a little bit more complex or more technical, like the internet, again, 2003 time frame was not difficult, but it wasn't the normal case you bring in front of a jury. Some people have never served on juries before, but you have a wide array of education on the jury, socioeconomic demographics on the jury, different ages, of course. We had to treat the jury as the most basic citizen out on the street that could be in that jury box. We had to pretend like they knew nothing of how the internet worked. And then we could educate them and build them so they could understand the arguments and the evidence we were going to present them in the following days. That's a very good question. We took at least one day to just educate them on how the internet worked. That's unusual, as you know, Jerry, to give a class to the jury for no more than, I'd say, an hour on a matter. But this took over a day. So the trial was successful. And I'm just really curious as to what type of sentence your subject received. He received a few years in prison, and then he was going to go on probation if he did his time, good behavior, and so forth. I learned later that he really never accepted the facts of the case, that he was guilty. In fact, his argument was, and this is actually important for your audience, his argument was it was his First Amendment right to air these grievances against the Philadelphia Phillies and Philadelphia Inquirer, in this case on a medium like the internet. However, being angry or displeased about another party or entity is one thing, but when you launch an attack and it makes other people's lives impacted negatively and sometimes severely negatively, your First Amendment right is not as protected. We would like to, one would say that it's like yelling fire in a movie theater. Somebody could argue that's your First Amendment right, but the public safety implications are not allowed for you to say that, correct? 
it would be akin to that on the internet, essentially, is people's lives were negatively impacted. Your First Amendment right is not protected in this case. And the judge ruled on that argument in the government's favor. I'd like to wrap it up, Jerry, with one tiny story. And that's the individual I mentioned early in the interview, which is a guy named Jeffrey Lamana. He was the individual who came to the FBI reporting nefarious activity on his bulletin board. He was very passionate about his bulletin board, and he also followed the case. And he was actually critical to the case. He stayed in contact with me after the trial was over. He actually attended the trial and got to confront or see Mr. Carlson. He and I became, I'd say, professional associates over the years after the case was over. He would call me from time to time. And that's not unusual, as you know, Jerry. You remain in contact with your witnesses and victims sometimes, even when the case is over. Several years later, he passed away from cancer. And Mr. Lamana was young. I think he might have been in his young 30s, maybe mid-30s at the time. He was a young person. Unfortunately, he passed away. And his mom used to call me every Christmas after he passed away and just talked to me for 10 or 15 minutes about the case, about how the case was important to Jeffrey, and that I was part of his life. She did that for several years until I, I transferred to headquarters in Washington, D.C. I just remember it was probably three or four years she did that straight. My colleagues used to wonder why I was spending time talking to the mother of a victim from several years ago in a case that was already closed. I just felt like it was my duty as an FBI agent to remain in contact with her. She felt like this was part of her life and her son's life. It was 15 minutes. It was no skin off my back to have a 15-minute phone call with this mother who was still grieving over her son and his death, but how important this event in his life meant to him and therefore meant to her. So I just want to share that story about how victims and their families, as you know, Jerry, you, I'm sure you have cases like this, feel a closeness to the FBI because it's a major part of their life. So I just wanted to share that story. Thank you for doing that. Definitely. I mentioned this months ago after going to CrimeCon, which is a conference that advocates for victims. I think we were doing a good job, but I'm trying more and more to talk about victims and witnesses in these cases. Absolutely. They're critical in all of our investigations. It doesn't matter if it's a cyber crime, violent crime, white collar crime. Victim and witnesses are critical parts of our investigations, as you know, Terry. This case was a case that you worked at the beginning of your career and at the beginning of the cyber crime program. Yes. But you have played such a major role in where the FBI is today with this program. So I thought we'd just take a little bit of time for you to talk about sure. the changes that you've seen over the years. I joined the FBI in 1999. Cyber crime was not even a program at the time when I joined the FBI. And just for your audience's background, prior to joining the FBI, I was an army officer. And then I joined a government contractor that did computer engineering for the government. So that's where I got my computer skills from. And I joined the FBI. They realized I had this background in computers. And of course, as you know, the FBI was like, hey, let's, we have a guy who knows this stuff. Let's send him to training. This is 2000, 2001. The FBI cyber division, the official program did not get created until 2004 by Director Mueller because the threat was so growing at that time. By 2004, cable modems are everywhere now. The iPhone's going to launch in about two more, three more years, right? Smartphones, uh, mobile devices are going to launch. We didn't know that at the time, of course. The internet is growing and it's not going to stop. That's kind of when the moment happened. 2004 is when the FBI created their cyber division, became an official program. And in 2006, I think it was, I got a call from a headquarters asking me to come and be one of the program managers of the cyber program for the country. That's what I did. And if you fast forward for the next you know, 15 years, cyber program today, you couldn't even recognize from where it is today from where it was in 2004. It has grown leaps and bounds. The training, the quality of our employees, our agents is incredible. Our partnerships, I want to really bang home the drum on that one. The partnerships with other agencies, with the public, with the private sector, with our foreign allies to cooperate. I mentioned the story about Canada. That was critical. Cyber has absolutely matured beyond what I thought it was going to be from 2004 to where it is today. I couldn't have dreamt where the FBI is today very proud of how the FBI has invested into the cyber program and combating these crimes. You mentioned that you had been an army officer. You developed these skills. Did you say after you got out? Yeah, after I got out of the army, I joined a government contractor that was a computer engineering firm. And they sent me to some training and that's where I got my cyber skills from. 
Let me ask my standard sure. question. When and why did you join the FBI? Great question, Jerry. So I thought about joining the FBI from a recruiter. I did not think of it on my own. I decided to leave the Army after spending several years in the Army, and I went to a job fair where there was an FBI agent recruiter standing at the FBI booth. I just went around to all the other vendors, and the FBI was there. I'll never forget his name, Jerry. His name was Dick Gray out of the Memphis Division. I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky at the time, which is on the border of Tennessee. That's why Memphis had the responsibility to cover that base. Agent Gray talked me and really sold the FBI well to me. And I'll give him credit, Jerry. He called me, I think, once a week, every week for months until I submitted my application. He really was, his perseverance was uncanny. I said, the only way to get this guy off my back is to submit an application. So I did. And I was interested in the FBI, but I didn't think I was going to have a shot to really become an FBI agent. I went through all the interviews, the tests. As you know, Jerry, you have to go through these screening tests to get in and finally got in. Agent Gray from Memphis Division, I want to thank him for being stubborn and staying on top of me to get in the FBI. You retired recently. Yes, 2021. Yep. What are you doing now? I know you're not letting those cyber skills go to waste. No, I retired after almost 23 years of service in the FBI, and now I work for Deloitte as a consultant. As you mentioned, I still continue to execute the mission of protecting our citizens just through our clients at Deloitte and making sure that their cyber defense posture is high and ready to be able to defend or respond to a cyber attack. So that's what I'm doing today. Excellent. We've reached the time now where I like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? Jerry, I just want to thank my former colleagues like yourself and the men and women of the FBI who are still fighting the fight today and protecting our country and our citizens and the Constitution. I just want to say that I continue today, continue to learn, and I never stop trying to learn and grow as a person. I did that when I was in the FBI. So for your audience, I would say to continue to learn in one area is to go find a mentor or mentors. I think it makes people happier. I think it makes your career blossom. It is to always be in a learning mode and always have the support and guidance from mentors. So I would like to leave that as my last word for your audience. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Matt Fine links to articles about his investigation of the cyber attack led by the disgruntled Phillies fan, as well as links to more FBI retired case file review episodes featuring cyber crimes. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.